Hello, everyone. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on the behalf of the team division. So in my role of program chair, I want to start by thanking uh, Raffaele Conti and Uni Son, who this year have worked with me to put together the team program, of which the uh, plenary is uh, certainly one of the most important sessions. So as we were given the task to organize the plenary, we had, of course, some preliminary ideas. But that's when we decided to turn for advice to a colleague that we have in high esteem, who is Miriam Mariani from Bocconi University. So we are really grateful to Miriam because she has been really generous with her time and she has really helped us shape this session and turn it into something cohesive and wonderful that we're really thrilled about. So please join me in thanking Miriam. So before I hand it over to Miriam to moderate the session, I want to thank our sponsor for the session, which is the Global Center for Technology Transfer at Arizona State University. I also want to say that after this session, we will have the chance to continue our conversations just next door in room 310 uh, with the team research networking reception with um, uh, drinks sponsored by Bayes Business School. So. With no further ado, Miriam, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'll try to be extremely brief because uh, uh, I know that you want to hear from the speakers uh, rather than from me. But just to introduce the uh, topic of uh, uh, today, uh, plenary session, so this is the question that we are, that we are asking. Uh, so is it the end uh, of innovation? Uh, are we witnessing uh, uh, a, a decay uh, in the development of science and technology? This is the question that uh, we are asking our speakers to address with their, uh, uh, with their presentations, and then I hope that there will be a discussion and a conversation at the end where they will answer also this final question, right? This is what we want to know. Now, where does the uh, question uh, uh, come from? So basically, the inspiration for uh, this session comes from these two papers uh, that have been uh, published recently. So one is the Bloom et al. Uh, paper, and the other one is the Michael uh, Parker and colleagues paper that also earned the uh, cover of Nature in March 2023. And what is the, uh, uh, the, the, the argument that they make uh, and the two pieces of evidence that they produce? Uh, so the first one is that ideas are getting harder to find. So the productivity of research of science and technology is decreasing over time. And I think that Ashish will come back to this. And second, uh, that conditional on the innovations uh, and the scientific discoveries that we produce, uh, these discoveries are becoming less groundbreaking, uh, less disruptive uh, over time. Now, if this is true, this raises a number of questions. Uh, some of which uh, being uh, listed here, but there may be others in the end that you will raise. So first, uh, is it really a new reality that we must confront? And if this is the case, uh, what are the causes? What are the drivers? So have the incentives to produce science and technology changed over time? Is the production function of producing science and technology different uh, compared to the past? Or it can be that we reach the technological frontier and therefore whatever we produce uh, from now on is going to be incremental and marginal, right? And this is inevitable. Or, which is what also these two papers somehow put forward, uh, it is a matter of measurement. So we are measuring new stuff with old indicators uh, and we are using old tools and old theories uh, to make predictions about the impact of these innovations. Uh, and therefore, it's hard to predict whether they will be disrupted, really disrupted. And related to this and to the presentations that you will see here, we want to know the types of innovations that we are producing right now and whether these are the innovations that we really want. So who is creating value from these innovations and who is capturing uh, the value that is created? Uh, and then by answering these questions, uh, which I hope this is what the speakers, these outstanding speakers will do, 
we also want to know about the implications. Uh, so what are the implications of these uh, emerging trends? So let me introduce uh, uh, the three uh, stellar speakers uh, that we have uh, here today. So Ashish Arora from Duke University, Marian Feldman, Arizona State, and Aron Asemoglu, MIT. They will have uh, between 15 and 20 minutes for this pre their presentations, uh, and then uh, questions at the end. So get ready, get prepared in order to ask questions and to have a real conversation in order to have some answers uh, to these and other questions that you may have. So join me in welcoming Ashish Arora, who is the first speaker, and the order is the one that you see here in the slide. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance uh, to present these views. So let, let me jump into it. Let me quickly give you an outline for what's going to follow. Um, I'm going to discuss the evidence for, for this proposition that innovation has ended. I'm going to argue that it has not, but there are problems. Mm -hmm. And there are three problems. One is we, prob we may have too much investment in innovation. We may be having difficulty in translating university science to economic applications. And third, there may be biases in the direction of technical change. And I'm going to offer you a partial diagnosis as to um, what might be the reason, okay? So, Miriam said that there are two papers. I'm going to briefly talk about them. They both have this sense of sort of impending doom. You know, all the low-hanging fruit have been plucked. And in fact, if you look at the evidence, there's some consistency. So the first chart you see tells you of increasing investment in university uh, output, science and, and, tech and engineering publications, research expenditures, doctorates produced, everything going up. The second one is TFP, total factor productivity. Not so much, right? It's, it's, it's trending down, if anything. On the other hand, at least at a, at a casual level, there seems to be no evidence that, that the fruits of technical progress are not forthcoming. It's, it's particularly ironic uh, to have this kind of discussion when we've just seen, uh, for example, the, benefit, the marvelous benefit of the COVID mRNA vaccine, the benefits of CRISPR technology, chat GPT. Uh, you know, I was looking, that, that chart there tells you about how rapidly the cost of solar energy has fallen. Mm -hmm. And when you get to my age, the last one is particularly important. Lily, <laughs> Lily just announced that they finally made a breakthrough against Alzheimer's. <laughs> All right. Now, the Michael Park paper, mm. you know, it's okay. So patents and papers are becoming less, uh, less disruptive. And that's, you know, unquestionably true on average. On the other hand, we don't care about the average paper. We don't care about the average patent. If you look at the very top, so this is also from the same paper, figure four. And this is about the, the, most, the disruptive papers, the top. And there has been no reduction in the, the best quality papers. Those papers continue, those papers and those patents continue to arrive at the same rate, if not at a higher rate. And if you look at the anecdotal evidence, there is again no evidence that, that scientific progress has slowed down at all. Just recently, we now have this potentially very exciting announcement of, of high temperature, room, room temperature, room pressure, uh, superconductivity. And there are many others that we can think about. So at least based on based my sort of gut re response is no, innovation has not ended. So what is the problem then? What, where is the malaise? As I said, there are three, three things you can take where the, where the doomsayers have it right. One, on average, innovation is incremental. Second, we are not seeing the hope for responses from the large investments 
we have been making in university research. And third, there's something lopsided about the innovation. As Peter Thiel's famous remark said, we wanted flying cars, we got 140 characters. In my bleaker moments, I think of much of IT innovation as, as, a, as a solution for a big problem I have faced, which is bored teenagers. Um, <laughs> and much of IT seems to be about that. That to one side. What, what do I think is a, what's my diagnosis of why we are where we are? I will argue that we, the US innovation system is marked by an ever progressively uh, deeper division of innovative labor. Large firms which used to be engaged in the production of scientific research are withdrawing. The returns to innovation have, the private returns to innovation have increased. As a result, you see larger private investment in R&D. And also, as a result of this increase in, in private investment, we're seeing the average quality or the quality of the average invention be lower. Second, the same division of labor which brings other productivity benefits has this problem of moving university research into the marketplace, and that's become harder for a variety of reasons. And third, a startup-based innovation system, which is where we're getting to, is going to have uh, biases in the direction it takes. So let me now show you some, some evidence. This is a brief history of, of the innovation system in, in five, 150 years and five slides, so very quickly. Up until 1900, we had a de facto system of division of labor. The big companies, the railroads, the most sophisticated enterprises of their times did no internal R&D. Univer American universities were largely absent from the scene, with some notable exceptions, and they relied on, on a system of independent inventors. Right? That slowly started to change with the beginning of the 20th century, and you see large companies beginning to invest in research. And one important reason is because in innovation became science-based. And this is particularly true when we think about the breakthrough innovations. And this led, then led to the, well, this and World War II led to, led to what you might think of as the golden age of American capitalism. Right? These are all, the, at the bottom you see the logos of all the companies that are sort of indelibly part of, of the American, uh, American economic history at least. And those are the pictures of some of the corporate scientists that won Nobel awards. Somewhere around the 1980s, many companies began to withdraw from scientific research, and we started a process of th the division of lab labor became more apparent. What I've not talked about is the role of universities. Throughout, starting from, from World War II, uh, universities began to invest and pr in, in scientific research on an ever-increasing scale, helped with very large uh, public investments in research. And by 1980s, this process had reached the stage where companies began to withdraw, and we looked to the university system to produce the scientific discoveries. Not completely, there are some notable exceptions, but as a first approximation, this is correct. Now, this is the, this is the history. The question is, how does this explain what we are seeing now? I'm going to talk to you about the problems that the division of, of innovative labor has created, but let there be no mistake. On net, this is both efficient, you know, it's better than the alternative, and I, I don't think there is, there is any going back. So even, even if we wanted to go back to a, an older system, there is no going back. There are lots of reasons why, why this, this system will, which I might believe in my, opinion will, will persist. Now, when it works, this system works wonderfully. We saw this with the COVID vaccine case. But now what, what is happening? On division of labor means specialization. Large companies which used to do both research and the commercialization of it 
are now sep these activities are becoming separated and specialized organizations are responsible. This then creates other sorts of problems. So let me, let me, let me just start with the, not in order, but let me start with, with, with one problem. What the takeaway from this slide, I will not go through all the pictures. This is the subject of ongoing work with, with Leah Sheer, who's there, and with Larissa Choka and with, uh, with uh, Sean Bellinzon. The point of this, this is university research is typically uh, abstract university research. If you just look at university publications, that seems to have no discernible effect, no discernible effect on what com in established companies do. What does have an effect? PhDs, people, and patents, inventions. One way to, s to think about this is the abstract knowledge that's being produced by universities needs to get embodied in people or in, in patents, if you like, for it to make its way into the marketplace. Right? And one, one way, an important way this embodiment happens is through startups, right? And that's the, that's the third leg of this division of labor universities, incumbent firms and startups. Now, there are many things that we can talk about here, but one is think about human capital and, and patents. These are not non-rival goods. These are not infinitely expansible economic objects. These are rival goods. They're traded in the marketplace. If I, have, if I hire a PhD, you cannot the same, hire the same PhD. So if you think about growth theories, things have to change in how we think about it. Now, so that's why, you know, that's a shorthanded way, what I just did, of showing why we are not seeing the benefits from university research. Because instead of the ideas coming into, into the economy, they have to go through this funnel of getting embodied in, in people or patents. The second question is, why is the average innovation or uh, more incremental? One way to think about when you see the, this, this paper about ideas getting harder to find, the first question you, you should ask is, if ideas are, are getting harder to find, why are we trying so hard to find them? If something is not there, why are we trying so hard to find them? So the, maybe instead of ideas being harder to find, ideas are becoming more valuable. So it's worth our while to find even more, even incremental ideas, right? And one way why the private value of ideas may be higher is something to do with, with changes in, in, in the size of firms or the changes in industrial structure. Here's a, um, here's a little bit of e evidence in a paper with Divya Sebastian, who's there uh, in the audience. And basically what we did was we looked at, at the quality of inventions produced by large and small firms. And what you see is when you, when you look at large firms, their ideas have higher private value, their patents, but lower technical value as measured by citations. However, reminiscent of my critique of the Park et al. paper, when you look at the top, the best ideas of large and small firms, they are not different in quality. So what's happening is large firms are, produce, are chasing many more ideas, they're producing many more patents, and so the average quality will fall. Last, what about the gaps? So uh, Ramana Nanda and Josh Lerner produced this very, uh, very interesting statistic, which is how VC investment is now uh, completely imbalanced. It's concentrated in two sectors, IT and life sciences. And even in IT, it's mostly software, uh, uh, that sort of stuff. This potentially leaves two important gaps. And by the way, remember, if, it, if large companies are not going to be able to use abstract university science, it's, it's on the startups and VC funded startups that we're going to rely on to get this, get these ideas out of universities into the marketplace. And what, what the evidence shows is this is highly lopsided. And we don't think it's because we don't need, you know, a, a new semiconducting material, right? Moore's law has ended, we're, we've reached the limits of silicon and we're still in silicon. 
And I've been hearing about the end of silicon for the last 30 years, and we're still in silicon. So why? So it's, it's not that the social value, we don't need new, new semiconducting materials, but privately, for some reason, this, in a, this startup based innovation system is not going to deliver it. Um, and in particular, the startup based innovation system is going to leave two important gaps. One is in the direction, as I've just said. And second, which is related to, again, the ability of large firms, is it's going to be limited in its, in its ability to deliver projects or innovations that require scale, that require bringing multiple disciplines together. Um, so just to, just to give you an idea, this, that is the, the number of authors on, the, on Google's uh, translation paper. Right? And if you see what disciplines these come from, there are software engineers, database engineers, linguists, statisticians, and even hardware engineers. I used to have a picture of, of the GPU, the, the special uh, application-specific semiconductor that, that Google uh, designed so that they could implement, they could do machine translation on, on a scale. And it, the fact remains that for certain types of innovations, this loss of the corporate research or the corporate lab is going to be a big problem. To repeat, I don't think we're going to go back. We, we're not going to get Xerox Spark or Bell Labs back, but it's important to recognize what we lost. So the division of labor has created more, more efficiency, but it's left these important gaps. That leaves the question of what is to be done. And I'm happy I'm going to leave this to my panelists. <laughs> I'm going to take a very different take on this problem. I feel that um, our science is superb, and we see that with the papers and academic patents, but I'm going to take a geographic perspective on this, and I am going to claim that because of deindustrialization, because of the homogenization of industrial economies, we have lost both our ability to generate knowledge spillovers and to absorb knowledge spillovers. And this is very much to our detriment. And so when we think about innovation, we really think about entrepreneurs. And there are just many papers that have, this have doc documented this decline in American entrepreneurship. This is from the Joint Economic Committee. This is the Republicans putting forward this argument that we have um, the entry rate, the overall this decline. And just think about this. Many of us teach entrepreneurship. We've never talked more about entrepreneurship, had more incubators and accelerators, yet less to show for it. And I'm going to argue that this is due to the demise of the local, the demise of local economies. And really, you know, for a long time, we've bemoaned the death of distance. And I think that this time what we're seeing is something very, very substantially different. There's a couple of really superb recent papers that show that the magnitude of the geographic localization of knowledge spillovers is lower. It has declined from prior decades. And in simply many places, due to deindustrialization, due to these divisions of labor, what we see is that there's not much remaining. So we are not able to generate these spillovers to be in Pasteur's quadrant, where there is a well-known use case and science can, be, can come to bear. And that also, once we have discoveries, they're not able to be taken up by people in the economy. And so really, this is a loss of the geography of innovation. We have little differentiation across places. And so deindustrialization is frequently blamed, but yet, you know, we have seen few industries come in to replace 
um, this loss of, of industrial capacity. And indeed, right now what we see is the distribution warehouse has replaced the factory. And that has profound implications for the quality of jobs and um, the ability of people to uh, maintain a high standard of living. This decline and change in industrial R&D. I'm very worried about the lock the loss of local economic autonomy and the decline in local ownership and then the erosion of political autonomy and authority. And so really I think we have to ask where are the winds of creative destruction? And technological revolutions are typically now a time of opportunity, yet we see through the 2008 financial crisis that too big to fail was not allowed to fail and in fact is even larger now. And so new, new technological revolutions are always accompanied by innovation in finance, but we are sticking to a model of private, um, private equity, in this case venture capital, the Silicon Valley model, which is really not about growing firms or growing firms in place. It's growing firms to then sell them. IPOs have become really rare events. And so we are promoting entrepreneurship, yet it is so constrained by a system that promotes an unrealistic model. M Martin Kenny and I have a forthcoming um, Cambridge um, element and it's called private equity and the demise of the local and we thought oh everyone says you know deindustrialization but why did we have deindustrialization in our economy why didn't we lose old dirty manufacturing industries and gain new things and we really think it has to do with this fundamental shift dare I say neoliberalism but we have, starting in sort of the 70s with Milton Friedman, a rise in this concept of shareholder value. What really matters is not sort of an entity as um, a way of, of, of serving multiple stakeholders, but that industrial assets only become important for um, what the um, rate of return that they're able to generate. There's a wonderful book on Jack Walsh, it's a biography called The Man Who Broke Capitalism. And so Jack Walsh took GE from an industrial manufacturing powerhouse, a white goods producer, into really a credit card company. And it has hurt the company, but it's just part of this larger move that we've witnessed. And we've also had just less regulation for antitrust, less consumer protection, and so we have now start, have just a high degree of monopoly power, industrial concentration across a wide range of industries. It's very difficult for entrepreneurs to introduce products to the market. When we look at private equity, what we see is that private equity started in the 70s. This was barbarians at the gate. This was restructuring industrial conglomerates to be able to extract value, break them up for greater efficiency. But now we have private equity investing in, is, that my, is it my timer? Yeah. Is it first? Yeah. No. <laughs> Now, um, what we see private is- Private equity keeping tabs on you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'll know if my credit cards will work after I leave. Um, but, you know, really, if in the sort of average Main Street, what we have seen is private equity has infiltrated healthcare, veterinary care, daycare, 40% of the American daycare market is controlled by private equity firms, and um, the funeral home industry. And so these are sort of basic necessities, retail, grocery stores, I mean, the list goes on, every activity from cradle to grave. And now private equity is buying water systems, <coughs> um, fire systems, garbage systems, and these kinds of activities really are recession proof, and they are paid for by the government, and they um, re guarantee high rates of return. And so we have had a shift over 40 years from value creation, that is inno innovating to create value, to value extraction. 
And with this kind of financial system, we're not going to see the innovation that we would want. And so again, when you look at any town USA, what we see is this increased homogenization, the same stores over and over again. And really some of this was the rise of franchises with then franchises being purchased by private equity. Um, we have a loss of industrial specialization. Now um, we're more likely to have functional specialization, headquarters, research labs, distribution um, in different cities rather than industrial specialization. And also one of the most thing, the things that's most con disconcerting is that when we have private equity coming in and taking over, well, newspapers, you lose the local news aspect, but you also lose the company, the family that controlled the newspaper, which was a local elite that would invest in local activities and create civic social capital. And so really that, you know, this has been dissipated. And when doctor's offices are bought out, well, what happens is the doctor is still there, but the doctor has gone from being a sole proprietor an owner to being an employee, and then any profits go to a faraway location where the private equity firm is located. So this has really dissipated the um, sources of agglomeration economies and creativity. And we see this very profoundly when we look at the sort of cities divided by income growth. And this is from 1995 to 2018. And so there are some places that have had positive eco um, income growth, and there are other places that have really stagnated. And um, this has, has just uh, gotten to be a problem. And the, the important question for us is how do we lift these places out of poverty? Um, and so another sort of problem um, is that when we look at sort of the wealth inequality, this is looking at median net worth and it's looking at the yellow is 1998 and the orange is 2013. And so what we can see is that the lower class, working class, middle class has all lost ground in terms of their wealth. And then when we look at sort of, well, we have to just go over and the chart, it's off the charts. And so um, you can see that the um, top 10% has really gained in wealth. And, um, and sort of then those little tiny bars at the end are the comparisons. And what this means is when entrepreneurs want to start a company, well, they go to friends and family. But if your family doesn't have any wealth or any money to invest, you're not going to be able to start a firm. And if venture capital and private equity is only interested in things that are easier to scale and that they know well, we're not going to get the radical um, innovation that we want. And so for me, the question is, well, what is a place to do? And so um, one of the wonderful things about the American system is the experimentation at the state and local level with policies. And you know, as an economist, I believe people vote with their feet. But yet, if you have this homogeneous landscape, then how can places differentiate themselves? And we would expect that places would pivot, they would have policies that would allow them con to construct some kind of advantage but there has been correspondingly a loss of local political autonomy. And this is the rise of what's known as preemption. And preemption is when a higher level of government restricts or eliminates the power of lower levels of government. So we have the federal level doing this to states and then states doing this to localities. And one of the ways that this has disseminated is through the American Legislative um, Exchange Council and then there is a corresponding city exchange council where they write the model legislation that is very pro-business, very anti-labor, and that really does eliminate the experimentation that could be responsive to um, local conditions. And so right now we're investing a lot in place-based economic development and typically this is viewed 
as a second best alternative. And we are, we're doing it because of the extreme income inequality that I showed you on the map. And I think that this is not going to be as effective for us unless we fix this system of financing American industrial activity. So we say fix the system and not the place. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to be here, and uh, I've already learned a lot from this session. I look forward to the discussion with Marianne and Ashish, uh, but I'm going to talk about the same problem from a different angle, and uh, uh, end of innovation or the distorted future of AI. And uh, I must say this draws on my work with Simon Johnson, in particular the recent book that Simon and I published, Power and Progress, and my academic research with Pascual Restrepo, and to some extent also my work with David Otter, but they don't uh, get all the responsibility, only partial responsibility for the mistakes I'll make. Uh, so I don't think we are going through the end of innovation. Actually, by many metrics, uh, this is a pretty innovative age. If you look at patents, uh, there has been an explosion in the number of patents in the United States. It's more than uh, uh, it's more than quadrupled in about 30 years, 40 years, and uh, especially patents related to measurement, electronics, communication have had a huge explosion. Uh, some of these patents may be of lower quality, but overall. Uh, there is no indication that the quality of patents is going down by a huge amount. And we are right now in the midst of uh, tremendous advances in generative AI, which many people view as potentially changing the practice of science and research in a way that could uh, supercharge innovation. And uh, we're already seeing some of the preliminary results in this in things like AlphaFold. Uh, I don't think that it can be easily generalized to other sectors, but, but certainly uh, if you talk to people from the industry, both in Europe and in the US, uh, the one point in agreement is that science, research, and new product introductions are going to be revolutionized. That being said, uh, there are many concerns with many of these new technologies, uh, including AI, but I would actually put AI as much more of a continuation of previous round of digital technologies. And I think the most uh, existing data shows that AI is now starting to make inroads, not just in sort of uh, small corners like chess or Go or uh, sort of pattern recognition on uh, on social media sites, but there is a growing investment in AI across different sectors of the economy, and the center of gravity of research in AI is shifting towards much greater applications. So for instance, if you track AI-related publications, it was mostly away from the domains in which there were applications, and now it's across all the domains from ad business retail, financial investments, and so on. There's a tremendous amount of optimism about AI. Uh, and The Economist magazine, uh, their souls be blessed, every week uh, press uh, on by writing yet another article saying, those who doubt AI are fools, and you are a fear monger if you are concerned about the future of anything about AI. Uh, so, for example, here the AI says, by lowering costs of production, AI-based automation can create more demand for good services, boosting jobs that are hard to automate. The economy may need fewer checkout attendants at supermarkets, but more massage therapists. So that's the future from The Economist magazine. Uh, but it's, it's broadly shared. McKinsey's reports reach the same conclusion. The Davos World Economic Forum reaches the same conclusion. And uh, uh, it seems like the opposite view of the end of innovation 
a, an even bigger acceleration of certain dimensions of innovations around the corner. But if you look at some metrics that we care about, you see quite clear causes for concern. So if you look at U.S. total factor productivity, economists' favorite way of measuring the efficiency of how capital and labor are being used, it's actually going through some of its slower decades. Over the last 30 years, actually, it's not a recent phenomenon, especially in manufacturing, productivity growth has been very slow. This picture that I'm showing may exaggerate this a little bit is because from the the uh, uh, disaggregated NBER productivity database, BLS's numbers are a little bit better than this, but, but it's a very, very bad productivity performance. Uh, it remains a puzzle how it is that in the midst of a lot of innovation, new widgets, new gadgets, new breakthroughs, why TFP is behaving so badly, but even more to the point, and this uh, overlaps with, Mar with Marianne, mentioned, if you look at wages, it really paints a somewhat bleak picture. So here I'm showing what's happened uh, to U.S. real wages by 10 demographic groups, distinguished by gender and education, all the way from, oops, what happened here? don't want to see these slides even. <laughs> it's not just your uh, phone, it's, it's worse than that. So I think that we ask for technical help and they're coming. <laughs> it's the end of people who say there is no innovation. <laughs> it's okay that they gave us space for the microphone. Make sure it's on podium. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the graphs are back. So this is uh, plotting the evolution of real wages, so deflated by CPI, for 10 demographic groups distinguished by gender and education all the way from people without a high school diploma in red to those with a postgraduate diploma in dark blue, and then they're normalized to zero in 1963, so you can track cumulative changes as well as the rate of change. So the 1960s, early 70s, they're very similar to what happened in the 50s as well. You have this period of shared prosperity where real wages for all 10 demographic groups are growing in tandem very much in line with each other. But from around the late 1970s, early 1980s, you have a sea change, much greater inequality that can be seen from the fanning out of the curves. But even more striking is that the real wages of 
workers without a college degree are dropping sharply. Even college graduates are actually not enjoying that much wage growth. It's really the postgraduate groups that are getting most of the wage gain. So a m very different picture of economic growth than before. So here is my explanation for what's going on. There are tremendous advances in technology in some dimensions and tremendous innovation opportunities, and that's been the case for the post-digital age from the 1970s onward. The ability of individuals and firms to collect, use, and transform into both algorithmic work and physical work on the basis of this information has truly exploded. But I think we are not using these technologies in the right way. And part of the reason is because there has been an overemphasis on automation, meaning using these technologies to perform the tasks that were previously performed by humans. Automation, as The Economist magazine and many economists and many business leaders will tell you, is an important engine of economic growth. But it cannot be the sole engine of economic growth, partly because if you automate too much, you are replicating what humans can do, you're not using human resources and human skills, and often automation brings marginal benefits. If you save costs or increase productivity by 20% in some human tasks, that's hardly going to be revolutionary. So if you look at key periods in history where economic growth has been rapid, automation was centrally associated with also new human tasks which leverage and use human skills, worker skills. So in the United States, in contrast, digital technologies have been channeled towards automation. And this has been driven by a number of factors, some institutional policy reasons, some tendencies in the tech industry, which I'll talk about in a separate slide, so let me not talk about that here, but also priorities of managers, especially large firms, that related to what Marianne talked about, the shareholder value revolution, that has come to see labor as a cut, cost to be cut rather than a key human resource to be employed, deployed, and made more pre creative. And this is becoming more dangerous because it's accelerating with AI and it's particularly dangerous because AI actually creates a lot of opportunities for new tasks and leveraging human skills. So to do that, let me try to explain why I said AI generates these different opportunities and also outline what my statements about different directions of research in AI and computer science in general have been. And to do that, I will caricaturize it a little bit, make it more extreme, but I will say that from the get-go, there were two very different visions of what computers should be like. Simplifying, one goes back to Alan Turing's uh, definition of what computers are about, his architectural contributions in terms of Turing machines, but centrally also to the imitation game or the Turing test, which celebrates the ability of computers to perform human tasks, which is in, in extreme, um, imitating everything that humans do, or the idea of autonomous machine intelligence. This is obviously one possible vision and has been very influential in the many formative stages of computer science and artificial intelligence. But from the very early days of computer science and information science, there were very different visions as well. One that goes back to MIT's Norbert Wiener, people like Douglas Engelbart, J.C.R. Licklider, on the other hand, viewed machines, and digital machines, as useful in a human complementary direction. Not human replacing, not human imitating, not autonomous machine intelligence, or what Simon Johnson and I called in the book a machine usefulness perspective. Both of these perspectives fueled a lot of research, but I would actually say many of the transformative technological breakthroughs came from the machine usefulness perspective. For example, Douglas Engelbart in an uh, event called the mother of all demos uh, revealed the computer mouse, which was critical for per personal computers. The early versions of hypertext 
and also his students developed pretty much everything that is now part of the smart machines or smart, I mean, smart computer, smartphones and things like that, like screens and uh, uh, interactive menus. But this perspective has been very much in the back foot, especially after the rise of personal computers in the late 1970s, early 1980s, where the emphasis has gone much more into making machines more human-like in, in the set of tasks that they can produce. But the reason why I am saying AI is particularly important, or the broad suite of things that we identify with AI, in the context of new tasks and human complementarity, because if you actually look at what generative AI is capable of doing, is it's an information acquisition, filtration, and, and communication system. So that's much more useful in conjunction with humans rather than in replacing them. So is there any evidence that automation, in particular the direction of automation that I have talked about has been uh, critical for inequality. I would claim yes, and a lot of the research that I've done with uh, Pascual Restrepo is about that. So let me summarize that with one figure, and let's just focus on the figure on the right since I'm running out of time. And the figure on the right has on the horizontal, uh, on the vertical axis, a change in the real wages of a demographic group from 1980 to 2016, so that period in which we saw that inequality increasing, so now I'm summarizing that with a single number, real wage change during that uh, 36, 37 year period. Uh, the demographic groups now are not 10, but more detailed, now they distinguish by gender, age, education, and uh, uh, ethnicity. And on the horizontal axis, we have estimates of what fraction of tasks that a demographic group used to perform in 1980 have since been automated. And the relationship is uh, strikingly strong, too strong. Uh, we've checked it so many times whether it could really be so strong, but it seems to be that a lot of the patterns that I was showing you early on is associated with automation, meaning that demographic groups that have seen those real wage declines those are the ones below the ten, zero there, you see the zero. Many of these circles are below zero. Those are the ones that are experiencing these real wage uh, falls. They are also the demographic groups where a large fraction of the tasks that they used to perform have been encroached by digital compo uh, technologies, office automation, equipment, uh, numerically controlled equipment, and robots, and so on. This is all pre-AI. and. AI may go in a very different direction. If after all, what I said in terms of uh, the potential of AI is right, even more so even if the, uh, some of the biggest boosters of AI that it's going to uh, spearhead another age of very useful work is right, you may think that AI is going to do something very different than the negative automation trends that I showed you. And in fact, if you look at the data, this is all pre-generative AI, there is not much data on generative AI yet, but pre-generative AI, around, from around 2016, 17, you see a take up in AI activity here, for example, by the hiring of specialized AI skills at US establishments. And it's pretty broadly driven. It's not just consulting and the computer sector, finance, manufacturing, sales, retail, are all showing this big take up. But what are the types of establishments that are drawing, uh, uh, driving this? So in this figure, uh, I use three different measures, but it doesn't seem to make much difference, so let's focus on the leftmost one, which says Felton et al. measure. Three different measures by other economists to classify the set of tasks or occupations at the establishment level into more replaceable by AI and less re replaceable by AI. Uh, so if you do that, you see that most of the increase in AI activity is driven by those that have a lot of things that AI could automate. And at the end of the day, that also seems to be very much related to hiring. Those same groups, the one in blue and green, stop hiring whereas their comparable establishments continue to hire. So the early AI is very much going in an automation direction. 
could this be excessive automation? Well, if it is excessive automation, it has to be, at least it has to have some identif identifiable causes. And in my work, uh, and including in the book with Simon, we talk about several factors that could be at play here. Certainly the business model of big tech corporations is very much pushing towards automation. So Amazon, Google, uh, for example, are not just automating work themselves, and they are in the sense that the amount of labor force that they have relative to value is much minuscule compared to large companies such as GM or GE in the past, but their tools are being used for automation. The excessive focus on cost cutting that I mentioned is, is one aspect of it. A lot of AI has become entangled with data collection and changing nature of government support and government regulations. Uh, Ashish and Marianne talked about that a little bit. But another factor that's also interesting at the macro level is that the US tax code creates artificial boost to automation. If you look at taxes at the margin, if you hire, I think I lost a lot of time here because of that. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> So if you look at, uh, <coughs> uh, the marginal tax that a corporation pays if they hire labor is around 25%. It could be even higher depending on how you count healthcare costs. If on the other hand you look at the marginal tax that companies pay when they establish digital or other electrical equipment in order to perform the same task, it's about 5%. And it's come down a lot. So that creates an artificial boost for using these technologies for automation. Now, all of this again becomes amplified with large language models because the speed of change and the pervasiveness of these technologies is going to be uh, quite different. But I think there is an architectural problem in these models which reflects the underlying vision of the technology companies and their, their way of monetizing it, which actually is trouble looked at it from this perspective because it pushes further towards excessive automation and centralization of data. They're not tools for reasoning, meaning that they are illegible. You cannot understand why they're doing it, which makes it very difficult for humans to use them for uh, increasing their productivity. There's an excessive authoritativeness. Things don't come with a reliability score. They come as a recommendation or you should do this or this is correct or this is incorrect. There's an excessive centralization. Everybody, there's no uh, uh, calibration depending on the task at hand. And then finally, this is sort of all entangled with excessive automation as I have mentioned. So I think uh, if we want to sort of rethink how innovation can be more productive, we need to think about the applications, which was very critical for other digital technologies, but also the underlying architecture of large language models may need to be questioned. So because the architecture at the end determines the, uh, the, uh, the applications, since I'm running out of, sh uh, uh, out of time, I'm not gonna talk more about the architecture, but you can develop these ideas in the context of specific applications such as education, healthcare, blue collar occupations or tradespeople like electricians where you can have generative AI tools but the current architecture would not be right for it. I also wanna say that this, all of this is US centric or European centric but uh, it will have massive implications for the developing world. In the 1970s, a uh, group of economists such as Francis Stewart, Schumacher and others uh, were pushing the idea of inappropriate technologies related to sizes of factories, of capital intensity of factories. Actually, I, I think there's a chance that uh, AI and generative AI could be the mother of all inappropriate technologies because they replace and reduce the value of the types of skills and talents and human resources that are abundant in the developing world. And if that happens, it will fundamentally change the division of labor and could have uh, fairly negative effects. So. Let me uh, conclude. I think there are really two phases of AI. Good AI and bad AI, and that's the same sense in which there was good uh, digital technologies and bad digital technologies. Good AI, in my mind, does not mean no automation. Automation will always be with us and should be with us. But automation is coupled with a human complementary focus so that humans are not completely sidelined. And it does not centralize information, but it uses information or it organizes information in a way that's usable. 
And I think my reading of evidence, both quantitative and historical, is that that good digital technologies or good technologies more generally when used in this way have been much more uh, fueling productivity growth, TFP growth, and real wage growth. But we've been much more stuck with the bad type of digital technologies and we seem to be on a path towards bad AI. And, uh, and this has implications for the US workers, US inequality, actually US businesses too, because if you don't use your human resources and your technologies the right way, you're not going to thrive either. So uh, there is no guarantee that I think, there's no, in my mind, there is not at the end of innovation. In fact, the optimist may be right that we are at an inflection point that could boost innovation in many ways, but this will not happen automatically, and the direction of technology matters, and matters in a way that cannot be just fixed by throwing more competition on it. So uh, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. So uh, I will leave this slide here because I don't know how to uh, just uh, use this computer, but then you may help me. So thank you very much for this uh, incredible presentations. Uh, let's see uh, how many questions uh, are in the audience so that we'll try to coordinate uh, the uh, uh, questions and comments that you may have. Uh, if you can raise your hands uh, so that we try. So there's uh, uh, a question down there, and then uh, uh, if there are more than, there's more than one question, we'll try to get two or three at the time so that then uh, the, the speakers can uh, share views on, on different questions. So let's, let's start with the first one, and then we'll take advantage of my role as a moderator or to, also to ask questions. There's a question down there. If you can introduce yourself uh, and then get to the point, uh, as quickly as possible so that we keep Okay, thank you. My name is Pierpaolo Andriani, Catch Business School. Um, there's just one point. I mean, in the article you cited, it's clearly written. Our robust finding is that research productivity is falling sharply everywhere we look. That's the point, whereby in two or three presentations, you are giving the opposite, an opposite view of the fact. May I, in pharma, you know, we have the inverse of the Moore's law, meaning since the 50s, the amount of drugs per million dollars, euros, has been declining constantly, exponentially. And this is probably happening in lots of other fields. May I just suggest that one of the reasons that science is less, pro science and technology is less productive is because research has been projectized, means it's been subject to project management, whereby the end of the, the, the scope, the meta goal of research is surprise. If, 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 we have to, if you have to declare in advance what your objectives are, you're not doing research or you're not doing radical research. And that is uh, resonant with what uh, Marianne Feldman was saying from from a, di from a different standpoint. So the question is whether the incentives to research technology aspiring to be radical have changed in the past 60 years. And the answer is yes. Before the 80s, the hypothesis testing didn't appear anywhere. And now you cannot find a project funded if it's not hypothesis testing. The question is, how do you generate hypothesis if, you're not, if you can't get funding to generate hypothesis, which is way more risky, and of course, the testing hypothesis. So I'd like to have your views about this, these points. Thank you. So I see that uh, Ashish disagrees, uh, and I know that uh, Marian has experience at the NSF with projects that were submitted, so we have to you can. Why don't you come here? Yeah, oh, of course. Okay. All right. So uh, I disagree. Um, <laughs> um, much of what you've described is correct, but my, my claim was not that the average has not fallen. Undoubtedly, the average has fallen, and there are many more people doing it, so the average will likely fall. The question is, is the best research still happening? And I would contend that it is. 
let's 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 do this over drinks. Marian, <laughs> <laughs> so on top of your experience uh, with NASA. Yeah, that's right. It's fine. Yes. Um, you know, there's always a sort of funny question: Would Darwin have gotten tenure? <laughs> no. He took too long, right? So significant um, contribution. Um, but you know, we have changed the organization of science. And so, I mean, I think that it's worth looking at. From, from my perspective, what I observe is that, you know, every state in the United States, and I apologize because my perspective is very American, but every state had a land grant institution that was very responsive to local industry. And so, you know, we see Akron, the University of Akron is all about polymers and tires. And so we have lost that. And because now national funding, less industrial funding, what we are seeing is again this ho homogenization, which to me is dangerous. But there's, I mean, the science is amazing and it's been disheartening for me in various projects to follow entrepreneurs who have great ideas only to see that they are not able to get follow-on funding and they end up failing and it's a net social loss. And so, you know, there is just something um, systematically wrong. Look, I, I'm sure we could improve how we organize science funding, but the, the, the question at, at on, you know, the, the, the presenting question is, is in fact science, you know, petering out at the top, not on average. And I don't believe that the evidence presented, both anecdotal and quantitative, uh, provides any uh, basis for, for that, for that uh, uh, pessimism. So we are happy if uh, innovation uh, is still uh, going on and uh, it's not dying. So this is a, a positive. Uh, and it depends on the use that you make, right, uh, mm. of those innovations. So, okay. So thank you for a very interesting panel. I was wondering, all three of you had trade somewhere in your papers uh, and wrote about that. I was wondering about the role of trade in all of this, uh, whether you com comment on that. It seemed to me that for Marianne, trade might just be amplifying the negative development that she described. Not sure about Ashish. Um, I have some inclination what Darren might say, but I, I would be interested to hear what, how the trade developments play into what you have described. Yeah. Sure, that's, uh, an that's another question. Okay. Yeah. Let's collect also the other questions so that uh, then you have more freedom in... Uh, Response. Thank you. Uh, this is GT Ozar speaking, and I think this will be mostly to the, uh, the last uh, presentation and their own. Uh, so when we talk about the good AI versus bad AI, how much of is it have to do with the use case versus the type of the models and algorithms that we use, and explainable AI and the policy push for that, how much of uh, that can change the, the outcome moving forward? Is this on? Yeah, perfect. Yes, trade is uh, super interesting. I think uh, as a direct factor, it has uh, played a major role in terms of employment changes, but it has played a somewhat smaller role in terms of wage structure changes, and there's a reason for that, uh, which is that you know, trade, for example, imports from China affect the industry composition, and industry composition tends to have less influence on wages at the end than when you change the task mm -hmm. composition. So uh, if you look at employment numbers, uh, for instance, work by David Otter and co-authors and some work that I have done with the same team, estimates you, know, you may have two million less manufacturing jobs in the United States uh, because of trade with China, but uh, the influence on inequality is not that great, is not that huge. Offshoring, on the other hand, which is part of what people put in trade, uh, is, is bigger effect, but still not as big as the technologies that we're talking about. But also trade has an indirect impact. Uh, 
So some of the sort of spread of the shareholder value cost cutting type of ideas accelerated first in the context of competition against Japanese imports. So becoming lean became a imperative or was felt like an imperative and that's led to reorganizations and then later against China same sort of ideas. In terms of the question about architecture of the models versus apps uh, or, or the uh, foundation models versus uh, uh, model developers, I think it's an open question. My uh, view is that actually the architecture is restraining that if you look at the current uh, s way in which generative AI models are designed and developed, uh, they are not facilitating, in fact, they make it maybe make it impossible for humans to use them in a reliable way. So, mm -hmm. for instance, what are we talking about uh, when I say we want, uh, we, we say we think new tasks can be created out of this? So let me give you an example, education sector. So education is, I think, is a major sector that requires an overhaul in the United States and in many other countries. And I think one sort of proven way which works is much more individualized education programs. But they're, they're not feasible, they're too expensive. So you can use AI tools, especially generative AI tools are great for just-in-time, real-time adjustments of classroom and, 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 and material. Uh, in principle because they can understand what's going on, they can help teachers, and, and you can hire more teachers, more qualified teachers. But it won't be possible with the current large language model architecture because uh, they're not gonna give ever the type of reliable, understandable type of advice to teachers in real time to react and use them. Much more they can be used for creating automated data banks or automated teaching or automated homework help. But that's not where the big problem in the education system is. So there are architectural reasons that are going to make that hard. So that's the basis of my sort of question. Great. And um, let me respond. I mean, I, I want to sort of draw these lines between um, you know, deindustrialization, the lack of investment, specifically in the sort of middle section of the American country, where um, we. Um, you know, it's difficult to disentangle this, but with private equity acquiring industrial concerns with their emphasis on cost saving, this led to a lot of offshoring of American jobs. It arguably accelerated that trend. And private equity has grown to be so powerful because it is taxed at a lower rate than other kinds of income. Right? This is the whole carried interest provision that makes private equity so lucrative. So just, you know, we say water will always go to the lowest spot, capital always goes to the highest rate of return. And so in this search for high rates of return, there was pressure put on labor. And I think you show this sort of substitution and, um, you know, sort of skill uh, de-skilling. Um, what we could have imagined a very different alternative future um, for the American economy where we lost the industries that were dirty and you know that we didn't necessarily want it's good to export these for other countries to have an opportunity to engage in these production supply chains but we went overboard right we saw this in covid that we don't have industrial capacity that allows us to respond. There is no resilience in the system anymore. So that's very problematic. You know, we also think when we have trade that we are gonna compensate the losers. The losers were never compensated. And so, I mean, this also leads to this decline in, um, decline, um, in wages and in quality of life. But, you know, I mean, I think that there are alternative investments that, you know, could really grow our economy, would be very innovative, could be based on this beautiful science that's being done, and then really could improve quality of life. Ashish, do you want to add anything? Um, okay, so let's see if there are uh, other comments and questions. Uh, okay, one is here and the other one there. Okay, thank you. So this is really a question mostly for their own, but I'd be happy if everyone else could chime in too. And it's that in terms of thinking about automation, and the link between wages is very clear to me, right? The link between TFP growth slowdowns is a little bit less clear. 
And I wondered if that connection could be made more strongly by thinking not just about automation, but just obsolescence in general. And basically inventions drive also obsolescence, whether it's embedded in skills or whether it's embedded in capital. And basically if you start to figure of invention also inducing obsolescence, does that help to calibrate the growth models where we can start to make sense a little bit more of TFP uh, slowdowns? So one, one question, this is uh, mostly to Daron, but I think that the other, so I am intrigued by, by your point of redirecting technical change from automation to lesson. The question is, who has the leadership to do this? So, so and, uh, and uh, I'll put it in terms of a question. So clearly the companies are not doing it. Uh, the governments, uh, I mean, I can only think of the U.S. government uh, to take uh, an initiative like that, maybe in collaboration with China, which is something quite hard to do. So here is my intriguing uh, proposal. Uh, what if uh, a group of highly respected economists from highly respected institutions ask the CEOs of the five, six companies who today invest uh, the lion's share in this technology and try to convince them of what Daron is proposing. <laughs> so Daron, I think this is in line also with what you write in your book. I actually tried with some of them. And they're very uh, polite, they're very polite, but uh, no action. Uh, and, uh, and exactly, and I'll come back to the, since uh, 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 we started with this one. Uh, I think, you have identified a very major problem. In fact, the problem is even deeper than that. You know, some economists uh, might say, and some commentators might say, that even if everything I've said is right, the governments cannot do redirection. And especially in a field like AI, it's impossible. And I think those are all valid points you have to take on board. There are examples of government regulations shifting the composition of uh, research in healthcare, we see that very clearly in many cases, and in some cases you can definitely uh, uh, see that it has happened in a beneficial direction, like in the energy sector where uh, there has been a tremendous shift towards more green, clean energy, and as a result, you know, Ashish also talked about that, you know, the cost of wind and power have come down by more than tenfold in 15 years. So, so there is a possibility, but identifying it, doing it, I think these are all very difficult questions. So, but changing the conversation, uh, I think is an important part of the, of the first step. I think if there is a greater recognition that the direction of technology may be distorted and there is a feasibility and desirability of having it in uh, a more pro-human direction, I think that's already a very important achievement. Now, in terms of your question, you're also completely right. Uh, so many things I've claimed in my presentation are based on what at least I view as tight evidence, like the wage employment effects and direction mm -hmm. changing, et cetera. But uh, the TFP things are much more correlational. Mm -hmm. The idea I have is that, you know, if you excessively invest in automation, you're leaving low hanging fruit in other areas uh, uh, unpicked, and and there seems to be some indirect evidence for that, and it may be a more general thing. I think you know part of the issue is that uh, we don't understand exactly how changes that are organizational or creates new tasks, etc., modify productivity, and that's part of the reason why we cannot make this more uh, concrete. But I think there is greater need and poten potentially feasibility for doing so. Thinking about obsolescence, I think that's an interesting dimension. I don't know how that shows up in the, I have thought a little bit about how automation shows up in TFP statistics, but for example, the fact that we change an iPhone every year, how does that show up in productivity statistics? I don't know that it distorts things very much in terms of the measurement of productivity, but perhaps it may, and that may intersect with some of your questions. It's a good question to be investigated more. Megan and uh, Ashish, do you want to add anything or we try to collect other questions? So, okay, so please. Hello, um, uh, Sergey Lebedev, Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Um, 
I ha so there was a bullet point in Marianne's presentation about value extraction over value creation. So I had a question about that. Do you think that part of the problem um, is that firms have more opportunities for end seeking and value extraction, such as you know, limiting competition, lobbying for tariffs, uh, uh, you know, uh, patent evergreening and things like that. And so they can improve their performance by engaging in that in rent seeking rather than in productive innovation. So it sort of distorts incentives. Thank you. I think definitely the incentives are are distorted, right? And so that you know it, it's risky to build a new plant, to launch a new product line. You know, it's very easy to take an existing concern and try and uh, uh, suppress wages. In many cases, these are leveraged buyouts, right? So you're using the firm's. Um, assets, it's to uh, debt finance the buyout, so that's not very risky at all. And then um, one of the common things is raiding the firm's pension plan, okay, so further kind of extracting um, value that way. There's another really significant problem, and we see this with healthcare, the acquisition um, of um, rural and local hospitals by private equity, which will subsequently close those entities, those establishments, if they're not profitable enough. And they're not going to be profitable, just given um, their location. And so again, that leaves uh, the community worse, much worse off. Does that answer your question? If there's another question. Thank you very much. I'm Netra Pan. I'm a member of faculty at Bayes Business School. I study entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was along the lines of changing policy as well. Um, so uh, Marianne, your point is to fix the system. And I'm wondering if it's realistic to try and change this tax code. <laughs> and should we consider other ways to fund innovation? Particularly, this is related also to Ashish's point on the narrow industries that VC, relate, uh, VC invests in. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on encouraging remote work or national guaranteed income that would subsidize new venture creation in a geography agnostic way. So um, let, me, let me make the following observation, right? Like generals, e economists are always doomed to fighting the last, you know, last war. <laughs> if, you, if I'm allowed to prognosticate a little bit, right, what we've, what we've been seeing is the effect of a progressive, you know, century, half century worth of deregulation, mm -hmm. globalization, uh, liberalization of the economy. If you believe, looking ahead, that that is ending, that globalization, the beginning of the end of globalization is here, we're entering a new Cold War, different kind of Cold War, many of the lessons that we have drawing could be reversed, right? So to give you very concrete, if you think we're gonna have a massive increase in defense R&D, national security driven R&D, which emphasizes security over economic efficiency, many of the things I showed you could get well get reversed. Let me stop here. All right. I think you've suggested a wonderful topic for next year's plenary. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I'm, I'm very um, pessimistic about our ability to really remove the influence of money from politics and to get much done at the national level. And so we are arguing in the book for uh, reestablishing um, re local political control and to allow uh, states to experiment and we see states instituting things like minimum wage laws, um, like you know, sort of labor standards, increasing, um, pr promoting unionization, happening very pronounced in uh, was in uh, Minnesota, excuse me, and also in Pennsylvania, 
And so, um, I mean, I think that kind of experimentation is good. Also, states have the ability to control economic activity within their borders. And so they can regulate some of this takeover activity. And so, I mean, I believe that that, that is the way forward. But I think, you know, we just sort of need this realization. Um, we've seen states experiment um, with neoliberalism, with creating a friendly business climate. And that was really a race to the bottom, right? It was low tax rates, but also when you're not collecting tax revenues, there was no corresponding increase in business activity to bring those, to bring revenues back up. And so that has been largely a race to the bottom. Kansas is the state that best exemplifies that. But now we're seeing a lot of investments with Bidenomics, right? In contrast to Reaganomics, which was all about austerity and, um, and trying to create a pro-business climate, we now have tremendous investments in productive capacity in the American economy. I think it's an exciting time to be studying things, but I do believe there's need for more systemic change. Okay. Okay, uh, Kenneth Huang from uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, I'm just going to um, take this in a slightly different angle, which is with the growing right tension, the geopolitical tension, maybe even U.S., China, or you know the war that we are having. Um, how does that affect innovation? Right, we know there's a disruption to supply chains. We know countries are taking measures to protect. Right, semiconductors are you know say ta from Taiwan are diversifying. They have a plan in Arizona. I know these are broader questions, but I, I'm just uh, very eager to hear the views by the panels to see how uh, what you think about this uh, effect on innovation and, and how that relates to the topic we have today. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll bite. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're going, to see, we're going to see a reversal of the division of innovative labor. Mm. I think we're going to see more in internalization. We're going to see established companies being pushed or cajoled to take on more of, more of the activities that given up. <coughs> we're going to see a reduction in the power of financial markets. Mm. I think this is what I think. No, and um, I think also that it is misplaced, <coughs> right? Um, you know, sort of looking at this as a trade war, where where that's like an easy thing to do. It's not really addressing doing the hard work um, <coughs> that we need to do internally here. So let me just add a, a final uh, question because uh, <coughs> uh, many of the people in this room uh, are not from the U.S. Uh, and the evidence that you provided and the arguments that you made uh, are about the U.S. Apart from. Uh, uh, one slide on developing countries with mm -hmm. some hints of what's going to happen there. So since it institutions uh, matter for uh, <coughs> the trends that you have highlighted, uh, how do you think uh, the arguments that you made and the conclusions that you have reached uh, <coughs> change according to the countries? And what evidence do you have about, uh, for instance, Europe uh, or uh, other uh, important countries? Uh, <coughs> I so I don't know much um, about about country uh, you know about I'm non US data my guess is your Euro Europe mm -hmm. looks a little bit like the US you know in terms of trends at least um, uh, whatever is happening here will happen there with a with a lag what's interesting is if in fact we we have the end of, or, you know, globalization ends and we have this more, then I don't know what U.S., maybe France's wet dream will come true and uh, they will have this, uh, this sort of more insulated economy. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's my, I don't know about, China is, a, I have no idea, and uh, India at this point is a disappointment. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I want to say that um, the UK has followed a similar model, neoliberalism and also financialization, um, you know, very different in, say, Germany. 
where private equity has not made the same kinds of inroads <coughs> and you have a more vibrant small and medium size um, enterprise sector. And so their institutions do matter. And I mean, I think that that can give us hope that there's a way out. Yeah, let me uh, just say, say a few things. I mean, I think regulation of technology has to be global. And that is one of the challenges. But there's also a lot of uh, learning that you can do from uh, other countries' experiences. China uh, actually shows that you can regulate the tech sector, including AI. Mm. They've just done regulation for a different objective than market efficiency or worker uh, productivity or democracy. But certainly that, uh, that has been largely effective. There are some lessons from there. European Union has also shown uh, regulation of tech can be done, but they've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, that also shows the need for sort of uh, flexibly adjusting these regulations. I think GDPR is super interesting. It had the right values, the right mm -hmm. sort of emphasis, but it's back backfired because it wasn't, it did not anticipate how companies were gonna respond to it. So it sort of highlights that you need to sort of change these uh, uh, regulation legislations as, as you accumulate more information. But I think, you know, the U.S. has just lost regulatory muscle. It does not have expertise. It doesn't have sort of the civil service ethos that was critical for efficient, effective uh, regulation. But I think it can be gained again, uh, although I don't, uh, I don't see how it's going to catch up with the AI company. So there will have to be some inefficiencies in that regulation. So thank you very much. I think that we are running out of uh, time. Let me just uh, do two things uh, before we close down. So I want to thank the organizers uh, and especially Elena Novelli, who was on top of everything <laughs> in this uh, past month. And then I want to thank our wonderful speakers uh, and panelists for being here and we learn a lot. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. <laughs> and finally, you are all invited to the team research networking reception, which is uh, next door now. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So I hope to see you again. Yeah. And, uh, as I said, if you just come by Milan, let us know. Yeah, I will. I will. Actually, it was great uh, to be on the same panel. Very, very interesting. Very interesting.